Hello everyone, welcome back to Our Town. Thank you for joining us for another episode. As a reminder, you can watch any of the Our Town episodes on elnanews.com or YouTube. You can listen to any of our episodes on your favorite podcast playing platform. This week's guest is none other than Rabbi Aaron Steyer, who is the National Director of Development for RCCS. I'm going to assume that you've heard of RCCS, and then you get to hear about what goes on behind the scenes and all their fundraising efforts. So when you sit down at night, and then all of a sudden your phone rings and someone's collecting for RCCS, are those cold calls worth anything? Is that a successful way to raise funds? What about those envelopes you find in your mailbox? What about if you already donated? Is there any point in still going to your neighborhood parlor meeting? And how does somebody who fundraised deal with so much rejection? So Aaron Steyer will tell you how he motivates his team to fundraise and all the stories along the way of different Balabatim and all his fundraising efforts and campaigns. So it's definitely an exciting episode. You will hear about our season sponsor, Sensible Marketing. If you are in healthcare, this is something for you. Uh, but for now, I'll catch you on the other side of the introduction. You are listening to Our Town, an LNN podcast. Meet the people who have transformed Lakewood from a small town into our town. I am your host, Mayor Dixty. Today we would like to thank Rabbi Aaron Steyer from RCCS for coming down to the Elnan Studios. Welcome to our town. Welcome, welcome. So you're welcoming to your town. I think I'm here long before you. <laughs> <laughs> welcome I'm to my town. I'm going to assume that you were born here from the common. Born and bred. Like a, a hospital actually was in New York, but I, I was born and grew up here. Okay, well, I was born in Monmouth Medical, so it could be, uh, I started off here in Jersey. (laughs) Yeah, so Lake Cheder? I went to Yeshiva Gitana, and then I switched in sixth grade to Lake Cheder. My father was a Rebbe in the Cheder. Beautiful. So I switched over, yeah. Then you went out of town for Masifta, you mentioned Peekskill. Yeah, yeah, I went to Peekskill Yeshiva, my uh, seven years, that's, you know. Beautiful. Long stint. People don't go out of town so much anymore. You don't, you don't have all these yeah. options that yeshivas here at Lakewood. It's funny, as like, when you grow when you go to yeshiva out of town and you see you see the bacham and the in town yeshivas and you'd wonder like, what? like they're not even in yeshiva. They go home at night, they eat good food, they play on the computer, and it's like Shabbos and like yeshiva was like <laughs> so intense. You would be in, you know, Myriv was ten o'clock, and then half the guys would stay afterwards. And like you look at the in towns and you're like, oh, it's not yeshiva. But today it's different, so yeah, my son's yeah. going to Hashem be going next year to Intan Yeshiva, so yeah, it's I'm like sort a... of buying into the, the concept. <laughs> um, it's like a day camp or a sleepaway camp. The color on a day camp is not like the color yeah. on a sleepaway camp. The big difference is that they had English in peak school, right. so you had that long break in the afternoon where you had a lot of fun, and right. today, you know, in the, in the Yeshivas here, they don't, so you're really going, learning straight, so it's really... Right makes a lot more sense that the kids are tired out and need to go to sleep earlier, so. Yeah, I mean, there's no regions here also. I'm still thinking the regions in New sure. York. Yeah, 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 for sure. So then you went there to Israel. I'm going to tell you how it went. Then you went there to Israel. You limp Herb David. Right. Yeah? Not really, but you're getting closer. Went there to Israel, part is for sure true. Yeah. <laughs> I learned in, uh, I was half time in Mir and then uh, half time in Brisk, so. Beautiful. I came yeah. back, then you came back to Lake, you learned the base manager, you you. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your first job after Bakaylo was that was that RCCS or was there a stop before? So I get that sometimes people remember this. It's it's funny, maybe even a, a tad embarrassing, but I had a my friend, I'm not sure he's gonna want me to mention his name, a real powerhouse of a guy. He's you know, he's the he's the idea guy and I was the hustler and he used to grow uh, California Aravis. He found fields, God knows where and he, where he was growing, you know, Pardesim of California Ravis, and they look different. The stems are very red, long leaves. You know, Kona Edaim was a thing, right? Is a is a is a thing as a simon of that Ravis. So it was my job to market it and make it like, okay, finally, you know, Hadassim Ravis, the love Hadassim Sregum, the love him is like a big deal, right? Everybody's sitting and looking and checking, but that Ravis, you just take whatever you want. So we had this slogan, La Rava Al Tanach Yadecha, from the Pasuk, La Erev Al Tanach Yadecha. Like when it comes to that Ravis, don't just say, oh, I'll take whatever there is. And we marketed this beautiful picture of the Arava and kind of Edoim with arrows and showing how our Arava is better. We brought it into the Satmarava in Williamsburg. We sold it on Lee Avenue. We did. So I started that when I was a, a bacher. We were Chavrusas in Peekskill. So he told me about it. I'm like, I'll sell it. Send to the Lakewood. So we used to set up in the Shuk a huge table. 
and we would make a huge tumult and you know uh, you know Aleph Aleph Aravis and we'd make all kinds of noise and I did this for a lot of years made some decent money of it I'll tell you a funny thing you know Fisher Schreira right that's like the, the yeah. line that attracts everyone in the shock we got Fisher Schreira I was like, how much fish is chayre could you have? I mean, a couple of thousand aravas that get picked through, and then you need the next bunch for fish is chayre, and then the next thing before you add, you add a fish is in an hour. We wrap it. So fish is chayre meant you put it back in the bucket. Exactly. And you <laughs> took it back out. Fish is chayre. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it was it was better aravas because it was yeah. <laughs> fish is chayre. It was the same pick through thing, but we had a lot of fun with that. I actually learned a lot of like uh, marketing and I, I set up a website for it and then I oh, yeah. was a lot of networking to reach out to people all over the country try to find Seichram who would buy it to talk them into that our thing was better and that because you know, we're charging much more money we couldn't afford to charge it as cheap as the other guy was. Right. So yeah, we had really to charge more so we had to convince the Meicher that he could sell our of us for at least a buck more than everything else so we could charge right. more and I used to just I you know, I'd go online and put in uh you know, Satmar Williamsburg, and then some number would come up, and I'd call it, and I'd say, do you sell our <laughs> say, okay. no, but I'll give you Yankel's number, and I'd go from Yankel to Shmiel to Beryl till we got found Seichem, and, and we were shipping them all over, and we had, oh, it was a lot of fun. We had such stories that shipments not coming, that our turning blue. We sent it once on an airplane, and the bottom of the plane is freezing cold. And Where are they coming from? They come from California. California, okay. So the, the bottom of the plane was freezing cool. cold, so <clears throat> our ovens really need to stay in like a steady temperature. So we get the boxes. They come in these huge flower boxes. And we open them up, and our ovens are all blue, <laughs> deep blue. <laughs> and we were going, we were going bananas. We have orders from all over, and every, and our ovens are blue. <laughs> it was so funny. We were going crazy. Say a few hours, a few hours <laughs> later, in our a few hours later, they turned green. Like they got warm again. They got warm again, yeah. and they turned back green. We had, there were so many stories like this. The shipment was supposed to come on in JFK on a regular flight. It never came off the conveyor belt. And the guy who flew with it, he he, could, he was doing us a favor. He couldn't sit around to, to figure out where they were. Oh, so boy. we were running around JFK trying to find where the cases are. It was the guy who ran the conveyor belt. He he didn't know what it was. It wasn't a regular suitcase. These huge flower boxes like the size of an urn. He didn't know what they were, so he just he didn't put them on the conveyor belt. So they were sitting somewhere in the back for hours till we could find them. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of things from this. Again, uh, marketing, advertisement, hustling, you know, um, networking. It was my L. I would take off second so seder and have a lot of fun with this. So that was probably my first foray into anything really. I did a stint in the um, the lulav shuk before dairy was a big thing. I had Spanish lulavim. And it's funny, there's a whole bunch of unspoken rules in this shuk. So everyone's young and top of their lungs, fresh as you know. And one kid pulls out like a little megaphone. And everyone's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> too much. That's against the rule. Because then we're all going to pull out megaphones. We're all good deaf. Like, <laughs> you can't do that. that you have to just fun. yell as loud as you could and that's it. When you do a rub, it's you're, you're, you're not there as much because you, you don't start right when the shuk opens. You wait and you have to, so you have to go get your table before someone else grabs it because you it's wide open. You're not using it, right? So other people, you have to hold your table, hold your land, keep your thing. It was like, it was, I remember when the shuk was in the downstairs of, of the Yashan when it was a bunch of small rooms. The whole shuk was just like a jammed hallway of people. I, I Once when I was a kid, um, uh, Yudi, uh, what's his name? Yudi Miller has a, also a Dalmedim, uh, business. So my, he's friends with my father. So he asked us to go sell uh, little of cases for five bucks in the shuk. The shuk was like, it's laughable when you think about what it was, because it was just, it was literally, I mean, the whole narrow hallway and then a little bit of a wider hallway, and that was the whole thing. So we grew up in that, in that shuk. We grew up in that minion factory, every bit as manam, the whole downstairs of yeshiva, which is not there anymore. They clean out the whole thing for the oitzer, but it was yeah. you know, old, small rooms with wooden stenders. It was nice and homey, and it was like, bein as manam, that's where everybody davin. You know? Right. And I remember if, like somebody walked in with a blue shirt, Everybody's been there. You never saw it. like you never. Because I, I remember this actually happening. Like, I came with a blue shirt. It wasn't even like a, a fancy blue shirt. He was a, like a, it was like a, you know, mechanics blue shirt. Oh, yeah. And like, I just remember like, look, like. It, was, it could it was be he got cold from the bottom of the plane. If you would have waited. <laughs> His shirt turned blue. It was, turned white, it was yeah. such a, it was, it was so different. It was like, I knew every kid my age. I knew most of the kids a year older than me or a year younger than me. You know, it was like, wasn't that, wasn't that much. Tashbar opened the grade under me 
And um, so it was Satmar had a class, which was basically all Litvish. Um, a few Hasidish kids, but Satmar had a class, YTT had a class, Shemitara had a class, which I was in till six, till sixth grade. And then and then Cheder had four. So it wasn't, there wasn't that many kids, like 125 kids. Most of them lived, you know, within biking distance. Where would you grow up? Which block? Sixth Street between Lexington and Mammoth. When we moved there when I was five years old, it was a very dangerous block. There were shootings. Mammoth. Wow. It was a scare. My, my mother was scared. It was very scary. But they were in the middle of building the complex on the corner of um, Sixth and uh, Mammoth. That, that, they were middle of building that complex. So we, like, we knew we had from people coming. And then Rabbi Pollock, Mashkech, and Yeshiva moved in across the street from us. So it was, it was like it became a little bit safer to, to, to handle. But it was but like, like it the was first four blocks houses? from Yeshiva. It wasn't that. It was an old house mm. that they re, they redid. But that those are townhouses right in the corner of 6th and... Uh, right, so they were, they were middle building those townhouses. So it yeah. was like, we knew there was like Yidden coming to the block. On that corner, across from across from those townhouses, um, what is it? It's the west, southwestern corner of 5th and Mammoth. There's like, there's a house there with a pointy blue... Uh, like roof over the porch yeah, that, yeah. that was officially a Schneer's house oh because it used to be you know the old shul area was more the from part of town and then it became the so he lived in between yeah. BMG and the old shul yeah I mean it, it, it was just five blocks from BMG it, right. it wasn't it was closer to the old shul than BMG I mean we used to go to the old shul sometimes to dive on Friday night because he had a seven o'clock minion I mean I should say he had a seven o'clock the minion part was the problem. <laughs> and he would he would sometimes be Rabbi, Rabbi Yafi would be like standing outside the door to see if anybody else is coming. It was like there was he, there was like in those days it was like in the middle of, his shul was in the middle of nowhere. Nobody was. Yeah. He had his sons and he had you know one or two guys that came to shul. I remember this guy came with a pickup truck, a blue pickup truck with huge monster wheels and a ponytail. He still had a few of those guys left in his shul, but it, it was I mean, it was very hard for him to get a minion. Now it's like. I guess it's the reason why Sons of Israel opened up. That was like the old school moving closer to the, I guess, I'm from not so community. Sure that, no, no? Yeah, because it was never like attracting the yeshiva like the Sons of Israel. They probably had a new new building. They needed the, they had the school. They had the, right. Um, Beautiful. Uh, okay, and then the RCCS was that the. So I I, I got into RCCS because. I was in yeshiva do, and I was doing a couple little side gigs whenever you know organizations would come around and they needed extra help, so I would join up. I did you know things for Lachem and Wen Elam and Masila and I don't even remember who else, but I did it for a good few places and marketing or no, they would, they would need help for getting the yeshiva light to come. In those days, we used to get guys in each chabura to go around. And give out cards. They would get like a, you'd get a mamun in each chabura, and then you'd ask him to give out cards to everyone in the chabura, and everybody would write in their donation, and you would collect it, and you'd come get it from him. Oh, that's funny. So they don't do that anymore. They stopped think, it. Yeah, yeah it was but it, it, it did used to do well. Um, so the job would be like to go around and like you know fakayf like fifty rosh chaburas that this is the. You know, but first, would be going to rosh chabura, finding out who the guy was, and then going to that guy fakayfing him, and I was that guy, right? That got fakayfed in the. You know, before it used to be, I always ended up being the rep in my chabura to go around and sell something else, you know, sell Barney Erlam. I remember going around once selling Barney Erlam from person to person in my chabura. I think I did a pretty good job. You know, I didn't just pass it around. I, I tried pumping the guys to give. Right. And um, so that, that's what we used to do. We used to push the guys, you know, get the guys in Yeshiva to come to the dinners that were in Base Vega that needed to fill up with as many bodies as possible. So we try to get as much as Yeshiva light to come. And, so I did that for a couple of places, ran, te- ran um, telemarketing centers for them and things like that. So when RCCS came around, I had seen pictures um, in the voice of Yasul Slamowitz, uh, their friend in Askin, um, doing shout out, a, a shout out big time at one of the meetings um, for one of the at one of the RCCS meetings. So I saw him by Chavustam on Yeshiva. I said Yasul. You got to get me involved. So he said, let's go. He had a parliament meeting at his house that night um, in Westgate. And so he said, come over. And I sat down with uh, Yitzhak Meisels, the marketing of- chief marketing officer at RCCS. And he's just, you know, what could you do? I told him, you know, I could do town marketing. I could try to bring guys in Yeshiva. He said, let's go. And he offered me like a couple of dollars. And then um, they kept having, they were, you know, they're from Monroe, Williamsburg. They had like no shaykhs to, you know. 
Was that when they were first getting into Lakewood? It was the first time that they ever made a dinner in Lakewood. Before that, it would be, you know, two of my chassidish colleagues still there, still knocking. We used to come around and go to Bat Midrashim and make a few dollars, but nothing. So this was the first time they did, like, an official dinner, but there was guys from New York. They didn't know anything. They had a lot of people here helping them out. A lot of wonderful people are still helping. Many of them still helping out. Um, but they didn't have, like, anybody on the ground to hustle and work, so they had a problem. You know, Base Vega changed the floor. Like the that week of the, the, the dinner, and also like they lost the lobby, and it was like <laughs> there was a bunch of stuff going on. They kept asking me to do it. I, this is interesting because you know I, I I always think back like it. I guess this is like if you want to run a telemarketing office, this is like a little bit of a dream to take out the phone book, a like a phone book, and just start calling. You can only do that like the first time you do telemarketing because by the second time you already have your lists of who gave, and you if you go through the phone book, you don't know. Right. Gave, any data give, anyone, so you, right. you have to start working with your data so that that first year that I worked for RCCS and I told them I could do a telemarketing th- thing they said we used to do a Madison title they would give us a whole room full of phones and I'd go to yeshiva you know the dormitory and pick up you know as many barcom as I could I would just pack them into my Madison title night after night and just pound phone calls so I'd done that a lot of times but I was always dealing with lists and limited lists and but when in, the, in RCCS, I went, I, I took the Lego phone book and I copied A's and I copied B's and I copied C's and D's and I just gave each guy, you get A's, you get B's, you get C's. And that was like the first real, you know, public, you know, what, what I call it, like, uh, in Hebrew they call it, like, um, public effort to no, raise like, fundraising from the masses, like yeah. just mass fundraising, like we just did calls, just. Is it effect- down the was phone it book. effective? It was very effective because yeah. the next year when they hired me to work for RCCS full time, that was like the base to, obviously the, whatever the dinner brought in also, but that was these that, things were the base. Is that way still effective? Because now there's WhatsApp and raise it links. And telemarketing that. in Lakewood is very, very, very effective. It's yeah. it's interesting because I do telemarketing all over the country, but in Lakewood the telemarketing is very effective. What's that? I don't know. I think People every place giving. Well, I think like was definitely extraordinary for the giving. I think that's very, very fair to say. I, I not to say different about any other community. I Give it up to, for our town. Yeah, yeah, I, get, yeah. I, get to, I get to, I get to, you know, I was in, I was uh, two nights ago in Englewood. I was last week in fi- um, for two events in five towns that we. I get all around. I think Clyde in general, is so ridiculously giving. It, it's like anybody from out of the the community would have you know no, no wouldn't be able to comprehend what's going on the, the, the amounts of money is ridiculous i mean we did an event in north woodmere 2 weeks ago we did $320,000 not a lot of pre um, soliciting or meetings or planned it's the people come they they get a slahavas to give and they give it's all over people are fantastic i think lakewood is very unique with the giving for sure because there's a real culture here of giving, and I, I could point to you like specific towns in Lakewood that have a real, you know, have a specific neighborhoods that have even more of a culture of giving. Interesting. There's a certain, it's a certain energy. I think the online campaigns also created a culture of constantly giving. So if you ask why specifically telemarketing works in Lakewood, I think, I think it's probably a natural, it's a natural system. It's some, you know, most of in Lakewood tried doing telemarketing more, and people got used to telemarketing. And it became uh, uh, just a normal medium that people respond to. I, I compare it to by the Chassidim in Williamsburg, Bar Park, Muncie. Like if, if you do an appeal in shul, a regular shul here in Lakewood, shul donations are a dollar. That could be five dollars. If you're RCCS, maybe be a little bit more. But in Williamsburg, when you do a shul appeal, you're getting three sixty from everybody. Right? You can use a shul appeal for real fundraising. So I always say it's like. Telemarketing Lakewood is like fundraising in shuls in Williamsburg. They're, they're, That's very it's interesting. A culture Each thing. town it's has like, their own thing. It's where people get used to giving. It's like I give here, I give there. I, I, in shul, I give a dollar because that's usually mishalachim. On the phone, that's a pretty normal thing. I get phone calls a few times a year from all the big organizations, and I give. In New York, the, it's not so much that way. It's. I think the mishalachim used to go around with quarters. So you gave a quarter because right after he was holding a coins. You know now it's credit card machines. I'm assuming people don't give a quarter on yeah. a credit card. But it's uh, Greenman, the big fundraising guru. He, he once said that he tells the mishalachim he, he did a mishalachim class once to ask for 180 dollars. Because he asked for 180 dollars, you know, no one's giving you a dollar. Right? There's, there's a limit to how disappointed you're gonna make the right. mishulach feel when he comes to the door. So the credit card thing is brilliant because you start thinking a dollar, okay, and 40 cents is gonna go to the processing fee. 
all right, I can't give him a dollar. So I got the dollar forty, dollar forty, stupid. I'll give him two dollars. So you start giving me two dollars, you're maybe making five dollars already, right? And the thing so with you know, coins is it would make noise to get your attention. With a credit card machine, you just like, you know. <laughs> maybe they should add a little beep. A little something. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I think that the Mishalachim get her, you know, get our attention job. fine. So it's. Uh, when, when, um, when you did these phone calls in Madison, it wasn't cell phones. You said mentioned the phone book was home phones. Now also it's a different playing field with cell phones. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. It definitely makes for a big difference. I mean, I think you could probably say what this was like 16, 17 years ago that probably less people in Lakewood had cell phones. Um, and people, cell phones I think were like more private than also like, you know, right. it's like intrusive to call my cell phone. Like still sometimes you'll call a, a donor I think it's more an older donor, and he'll be like, "Who would you get my cell phone number? You know, my uh, don't call me on my cell phone." Right. Today, you know, it's pretty much like. Uh, I think after that, there was an era of like, "Yet the text first. Can I call? When can I call you?" And now, if you call, I'll tell you like, I, I this is a personal feeling. I know a lot of other other um, fundraisers don't feel the same way as I do, but I feel that um, WhatsApping somebody is a little bit intrusive. Also, like, don't if you're gonna if you're gonna like want to text the donor. Again, this is like everybody's got to have their own hair of how to do things. I don't think there's any one way. Right. If you're gonna text the donor, don't do it on WhatsApp. It's a little bit too much. Right? You can see when he's online. You can see if he read it. Then you're a little bit like taking advantage. Send a text message. The guy's gonna see it just fine. That's always been my uh, interesting. I wonder if you thing. have this fun fact of like how much of your Lakewood budget is covered by these small eighteen dollar donations, and you get a phone call from RCS. Here's eighteen dollars. Um, is that? I don't know. I don't know that I have like a stat on it, but. I think one of the amazing things about the way RCCS in general and Lakewood also has been running their fundraising is, like, I, I, I believe this to be true, maybe because I'm biased, but I think it's probably true anyway, is that everyone in Lakewood wants to donate to RCCS. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful cause. It could be, you know, it's a Shmir Matasio once said this at one of our, our early meetings, like, it's the best insurance you can buy for your family. It's a Shmir why would somebody not want to give to RCCS? You know, occasionally you hear somebody maybe, you know, had some story they didn't like, which we take very seriously to environ what happened. That's very rare, Baruch Hashem, very rare that there's a complaint, but 99.999% of the people, maybe they don't know about the organization, maybe that's why, but most people want to give. So you, why would somebody not give would probably be because just now is not a good time. That, that'd be most of the case. So to me, it's like if an organization that appeals to practically everybody then the best thing to do is to just get to everybody right instead of spending so much time just trying to build up you know 2,000 people there's 20,000 people in Lakewood try to get to everybody so you're asking about $18 donations you know $18 donations uh, 1,000 $18 donations is $18,000 it's not a lot of money but obviously we need a lot more big right. money as well we always push for 360 and that helps drive a lot of people to, towards 360 um, we have thousands of people giving 360 signed up for monthly credit card donations for those amounts a little bit lower a little bit higher but it's been the uh, same thing the gear harmonium the mass the mass fundraising you know just trying to get the whole community to respond because yeah you know, when you when not every yeshiva or every mice it has the I mean especially a private yeshiva right it doesn't necessarily have the the appeal to get everyone in town to give but an organization that helps the whole community and and is is deeply appreciated. It's well understood of why it's why why there's uh, why you know what the value is. Then it's not you know it's the the it's not hard to get people to give. It's hard to get you know to ask everyone. It's hard to make twenty thousand asks right. right to get into Come everyone's everyone. face and make an ask. You know most pe most people don't just like see an anime. They go oh, I want to give to RCCS. They have to be asked. So the job is to make as many direct asks as you can. So telemarketing. Can make thousands of asks. Parliament meetings last year we did fifty-five parliament meetings in Lakewood. So this year we're trying for a lot more. Um, so that that gives you thousands of asks. The mail gives you a very decent amount of asks. I don't know who people are that answer that look at mail. But Dude, I was wondering, do they? Do, like when there's do. an envelope stuffed in Lakewood courier package? I always say like I, I don't even know. I don't even see my mail. Like and and. I I'm assuming if people are still sending them, it. it's working. Yeah. There are people, and I, and I know who some of these people are because I see them do it every year, who send even right. a dollar in every envelope. You know, the stuck organization shouldn't be wasting money on the on the envelope, but it's not really just the mail. It's the, first of all, even mail helps put you in the psyche that you're running a campaign now, even if someone sees it and chucks it, right? But um, it's also 
people get the mailing and then they go online, people get the mailing and then they call in. So it's not just about the mail itself, but people respond to the mail. So that that's my, you know, the first and foremost goal has always been to ask, to direct ask as many people in town as possible to give. And then to start working on the individual donors in Bali Tzedakah and asking them to give more. I used to see a locker number in the BMG uh, locker room. Is that, how much did that bring in? Is that still a way of collecting? Is that... One of my, uh, what's the right word, my biggest inspirations in the job of working at RCCS, and, and I'm talking about coming from a perspective of raising many, 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 many millions of dollars across the country, right? With a, with a, it's obviously not only me, I have a team of 10 people, right? Right. But of all the donations that I've seen, and all the giving I've seen, all the Nadiva Salev, and all the Chesed, the thing that touches me, probably the most is opening up the BMG locker and seeing a Karen Evan Abaychen check in there or a Shmir Sestarim check in there. Really? That touches me the most. That's to see a younger man who probably needs that money to buy food, right? If he's doing the Karen Abaychen, you know, tests, it's probably because he needs the money. Right. At least a lot of it is probably because he needs the money. For a guy to take that check and go walk over to the locker and BMG and stick it in, I've got chills saying it now. Oh, beautiful. To me, that's, and I say it over all the time. I say it when I'm out of town all the time. I tell people this all the time. I say, like, to see a curly young man take his check, it's 110 bucks or whatever it is, right? It's, yeah. it's money that he probably needs, and for him to go put it into the into the locker. I, so, so you asked about the locker. I love the locker. It's still up and running? Um, Do still, lockers, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't run the directly hands-on right. the Lakewood fundraising department anymore, so I'm not like a clued in on every piece of it anymore. But yeah. we usually have the locker during the campaign season. At some point or another, Rabbi Klein will tell us that he needs it for another place, and then we'll get it back again. At, you know, at the next campaign season season comes, so we usually have it for a lot of months in the air. But I'm wondering how uh, like uh, you know you started those phone calls. When did Parliaments kick in, and when did Razor campaigns kick in, and what was that shift like? So, uh, parlor meetings, really, um, 15 year, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, a lot of organizations were running very intense parlor meeting campaigns. So it's not something that we invented. Um, I had worked for Barney Oilam, the campaign before um, I did RCCS, and we ran together um, with uh, Shmuel Weiss, who's an adopter curl, uh, Melly Anisfeld, who probably doesn't want his name mentioned. Uh, us, you know, us three together, we ran for Bani a lot, of, ton of parlor meetings, just mass-produced parlor meetings. So I had learned what what parlor meetings were like there. But those days, parlor meetings were basically, you know, you call the guy from the table and chair rental. You got a couple tables and chairs. You called the food order, you know, in from wherever it was, Glopite, and then you'd go to the store and you'd pick up, you know, the gray plastic tablecloths. You had a bunch of wire racks for the shafers and and you know sternos, and you had the you know, cheap. I think it was like white, white paper plates and forks, and 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 and, and, and there was sesame chicken pepper steak kishka. That was the menu. So when I started working at RCCS, I I had the feeling. I think I mean, my first events I actually did do with plastic tablecloths, but I had the hargasha to try to step it up and make our parlor meetings feel a little bit more like an event than just a mass produced thing. So, um, I started off. I think the first year I did. Well, the first year we did, we divided the whole town into five areas, and we did an event here down the nine in Australia, and we did one in um, uh, in the park by Somerset Walk for that whole area, and we did one in Brook Park, and we did one on 14th Street, and then like we culminated it with the Shiva one officially, and that was like you know Kilo our first dinner. Um, but the year after that, I started doing parlor meetings, so I you know the first thing was let's get cloth tablecloths, let's get. Centerpieces. We went to the dollar store and we bought these glass um, candle holders that held tea lights, and then we went a tall one and a short one. Um, let's have you know hard plastic plate, even clear, but just you know hard plastic plates, nicer forks. Um, make sure that you know to never have sesame chicken or pepper steak in a menu. <laughs> and out of your I'm still yeah. pretty mock, but on that, right? Um, it should just be. We should be geschmack of food. It shouldn't be the typical. And uh, then we later we bought nicer centerpieces and you know, started making more money. I was able to little, invest a little bit more. We got nicer, you know. We got lanterns. So did you see the donations reflect the uh, niceness of the the, the so, event? So I I remember this. Um, I I repeat this a lot of times. Also, we did an uh, an event 
I think you're, you're really asking a very sadistic uh, fundraising question. I, that, that's... I'll tell you where I'm getting at. You'll see, I'm, you know, I'm getting at that by my neighborhood. It's nice. It's nice. But then I see pictures of other neighborhoods with that's Shreki right. and okay, MBD. Let me, let me tell you this. <laughs> I do not put pictures of food on my status anymore from events because I get so much flack yeah. from other neighborhoods. <laughs> it's not a joke. I, I never put pictures of food anymore. Right. I used to, you know, if it was a nice buffet or something, I would, uh, you know, we do a lot with Menachem Tesla. He's downstairs and over here. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. I've been working with him for, for already. This is our 10th season. He's been very kind to us. Um, so, you know, you set up these beautiful buffets and I would take videos of it and put it in my status and then I still don't know by the amount of aggravation I got from <clears throat> our neighborhood. You think That's right? great. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I say? And I say this without any, any, any hate to the neighborhood that we do make a little bit nicer, right? Because you have to, you have to, you know, reciprocate. You have, you have to present in each neighborhood the way it'll work. But... Specifically, talking to a certain neighborhood where the guys were complaining and they raise a lot of money and the food is not as fancy as other places. I said, "Be very proud of yourself that you your neighborhood raises that amount of money, and most of it goes to the stucca. It doesn't need to be spent on the food. It's something to be very proud of, right? There's, you know, the standard keeps going up. It's it's been going up every single year to be a little bit nicer and a little bit fancier because it's competition, right? But just be so proud of yourself that you don't need more than that. That the guys will give." Um, the times when you spend more money is usually, right, it's not so fair what I'm saying because it's, when you're talking about a neighborhood where you don't spend a lot of money, it's usually because there aren't that many people giving large amounts of money. But when you want to go to a neighborhood where guys can give, you know, a lot of guys can give 500,000, 1,800, 3,600, then you really have to come in and show that you're serious about it and that you put down a real event. And you asked very so just took a question about does the food matter, does the upgrading matter? Right. I think that's a much bigger question in general in fundraising. And right. It, 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 the the sort of in the core of it is that a donor, any donor, first of all in general, anytime someone walks over to a person and says, can you give tzedakah? Be like, yeah, sure, here's 10 bucks, right? Why? Why did they give 10 bucks and not 180? Because you didn't, you didn't ask for it, right? You didn't set up anything. When you go to a person and you say, can you give 50 bucks? I say, okay, I give 50 bucks. Same guy, same ask. Can you give 180 bucks? Mm, okay. Right, you, if you don't give someone in their mind a mascara of what, of what to give, and they just have to pick the number out of the hat, that that number is usually going to be low. Right, you need to set it up. So all these things are part of setting up the ask. And if you come into a place and you show that you you take it seriously, it's important. This is a we're investing in it. I think it's very subconscious, but people understand better what you're looking for. People recognize in any fundraiser, in any in a conversation with a fundraiser individually or through an event or campaign, what the ask is. You give more money to things that make more of a big deal. You give more money to fundraisers that make more effort. All right. So it's all it's all tied to each other. The the knee jerk reaction to when you asked me the question was that we went once did a parlor meeting, um it was in the home of, of uh Ellie Klein uh, of aisle nine, um, and it was a little bit nicer because he had brought sushi platters from the from the store, and it was a nice, it was a pretty nice event. And the guy walked in and he went, "Oh, you guys mean business here? You want real money?" Huh? And it was such a good, such a satisfaction because this you say it is the you say that's always it's been funny. in my mind that you you're you're sending us a, a message, a subconscious message that we're here for real. If we put the effort in. It's because we're not looking for ten bucks. You you put plastic tablecloths, you're gonna get plastic tablecloth donations. I it's funny. I, I I never thought of it that way, but I get a kick out of it. Maybe I'm a little mean when someone calls me like with uh, you know some campaign or something. I say, when you called me, what amount did you have in mind? And right away, you don't you don't want to put pressure on me. Like no, I don't have anything in mind. Whatever works for you. I'm like no, it's a big error. You, you, didn't, didn't, you really? must give a number. You it, me it, or them the fundraiser. If you don't say a number to a person, you're you're automatically going to get a lot less in almost every scenario. People need to have a frame of reference to, yeah. as what to give. Like, I don't know what you, you want, 10 bucks? I'll give you 10 bucks, 50 bucks. It could be a world of a difference. You, you could go into a person expecting, right? He was expecting to give you $5,000 and you could walk out with 18000 How did that happen? Because you hadn't asked him, so he was thinking right. of what he valued it as. Then but then too much also, they'll say, get out of here. I'm not giving you $18,000, right? So then you, 
It's a it's a, one of the big machlekes in, in yeah. the fundraising world. Is if you I just get a good kick when the person's like, no, I, I didn't have anything in mind. Like you didn't call for a dollar, right? So what, you obviously had an amount like fifty. What do you have in mind? And it's funny. Don't you think of it this way? Like people have a certain amount of either mice or money they want to give, and it's just between which stuck organization. So you're kind of like competing against other. So so I say a lot of times that. Um, a big Baltstaka, a very generous person, doesn't need a fundraiser in order for him to gift Staka, right? He's going to give Staka regardless. He's a tremendous Baltstaka. He gives a lot of money. There are others who probably could give more than they're giving. So when you push and you know how to press the right buttons, then you can get more money. Um, and then, especially with, then when you're talking about the Hamoinam, the general population, it's very probable that most people don't sit down at the beginning of the month and calculate how much money they give to Staka. They don't really have that much money to give to Staka, and most times when they give it, it's because you know they they feel the you know they get warmed up or they appreciate it or, or maybe someone's pressuring them, and they so you it really does matter to how well you work it to get that. I mean, take a, a curly young man who comes to an event and gives three sixty. He probably doesn't give three sixty all the time. To, to every place that comes his way, right? But you got him warmed up and he gave it. Does that mean another organization, other places can get less? It's probably not because this guy is not giving from the pool of money that he set aside for it stuck. He's giving from his heart and whatever tugs his heart is where he's going to give. So really, it really matters. But when you're talking about a very big veer who gives a tremendous amount that's stuck all the time and he doesn't need you, then you're really just trying to get your way in there to try to get a chunk of it and... and yeah. You know, position yourself but I think with most people I know myself I, I don't have a ton of money to give so it's whatever if something right. t- talks to me I give it and I give sometimes more sometimes less it's so and how to raise a campaign is I want to throw one more thing in that because yeah. I said about pushing and I think it's an important thing it's a very important you said I, you know once in a while I talk to people and they say that you know I don't like fundraising because I, I don't want to be a schnarr I said to them, you you don't belong in fundraising. Because if you look at fundraising as schnarring, you're in bad news. Not because because, uh, of your headspace. Because that means that in your mind, fundraising means you're going to nudge and annoy people and and creak on people's nerves. And if you do that, then you're doing this. Fundraising is a profession like any other, possibly a lot harder than others. So what's your job mindset is to or go, your feeling when you're knocking on a door of some gavir? Your, your, your job is that you're you're going to be mazaka somebody with something. You're going to enable somebody something. You're going to warm somebody up to something. You're not, if you're pushing people, if you're creaking up people's nerves, if you're driving them bad, you're calling too often, you're texting too often, you're driving them nuts, you come in like a kvetch, you're squeezing them for money, then you're really bad at it and you're not going to raise a lot of money. You have to work as if, not as if, you have to work with the idea and the the culture and the process that I'm here to be mezaka somebody with the mitzvah, and he loves to give tzedakah. He just needs to know how important our cause is, and he needs to be made aware or convinced as to why our cause should get you know a larger gift than than maybe he had in mind. But if you're gonna sit and calm and come on, please, 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 you do not belong in this field, and you will never be successful. How long did it take you to learn the tricks, or did you have it in you? Oh, I don't know. I made a lot of mess ups. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Any it's, stories come to mind? <laughs> the stories that come to mind are are bizarre stories. Uh, I had um, I was just sharing this with somebody else a few days ago. Um, I like to start it with Rapesha Cohen, the founder of RCCS. Rapesha's a a wealthy man. He owned the payroll company. He's got other things going on. He started the organization because he was helping a friend. And then he helped another friend, then another friend. Right? He was paying insurance premiums until it became an organization. Um, so Reb is no schnarr. Reb raised, you know, millions of dollars. Reb has that respect that when people come in, they're looking at a powerhouse of chesed. Yid who's helped, you know, thousands and thousands of sick people. They have a tremendous respect for him. It was by a shiva once, <clears throat> and um, someone introduced him to somebody as the head of RCCS. And the guy started screaming at him in front of everybody. You chassidim, you're a bunch of schnurs. All you want all day is people's money. On and on and on and on and on. Go get a job. And here he's talking to a very wealthy man, a very successful man, a man who has a huge company and a huge organization. 
He doesn't need a dollar from anybody. All he does is give. And Rebbe kept his oh, mouth wow. shut. He didn't say one word. The next day, Rebbe um, Heshel got a phone call from a, a non-Jewish lawyer. He said, Rabbi Cohn, remember we were on a plane together seven years ago and you shared with me about your organization? He said, yeah. He says, well, I'm, I represent a non-Jewish client who's writing his will. His wife, who, who passed away, was Jewish. And he'd like to put in his will uh, some Jewish causes. And I remember how special your causes were putting you in for $100,000. Beautiful. So Rabbi Heschel said, you know, that he, he felt that that was the response to keeping his mouth shut. So wow. it was a little while after that that I was doing um, an appeal in a shul, and I don't like to do public appeals. It's not very standard in Lakewood, and it's not, you know, it doesn't it doesn't feel very bakavidic. But just like a bomb. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. feel, you know, it's just the rough, shlita, it's just goodbye. Yeah. It doesn't feel comfortable to speak before Asher Valtzian. There's a certain shul in Lakewood that they... It's typically done there, and they, and they want me to do it that way. So I did it, and I was really very embarrassed. You know, like I said, I was like 50% embarrassed. And I said something, a statistic, and someone started to scream at me like, you can't imagine, you got a lion hooting, screaming and yelling at me. In front of the entire shul, as if I was 50% embarrassed, I was, and I was like through the floor. I, was, wow. I felt like, I can't tell you, it was, I, I was so embarrassed to do it to begin with, and then the guy literally, maybe I said something wrong, I'm... I'm you yeah, know? but still, it doesn't want. But like in front yeah. of like, there was like two hundred people there. I was so embarrassed. So, I went outside, and he came over to me, and he continued screaming at me. And as chatoni maskeriyam, I didn't keep my mouth shut. I told him, "You really embarrassed me in front of the whole shul. I think you have to. You should ask me mechila." And he eventually came around because he was mad. So you know, right. but a few minutes later, he came up. Whatever. So I, I didn't keep my mouth shut. I didn't do as good as the partial did. But the next night, we were by a parliament meeting for Koyal Light. Only Koyal Light there. And the guy handed me $25,000. I it blew my mind. It was like completely, completely unexpected. Koyal Yungleit, yeah. So I said, if, I said you know, the partial kept his mouth shut. He got 100 oh. I didn't keep my mouth shut. I got $25,000 out of his hand. So right. that was the story. But I've gotten his hand a lot of times from people. People being nasty. Um, even like not, not because I did it. I'm sure I've creaked on plenty of people's nerves over the years. It takes, you know, even even when you're professional at it, you could end up annoying people and bugging people. But you, you know, I'm a ton of person. I don't like to bother people in general. Um, but I've had people where like, you know, all I did was say hello in in a, in a grocery store, or and a guy started screaming and yelling at me in front of everybody. Who do you think you are? You think you're my friend? And, and everybody's looking at me like I probably said the craziest thing to the guy, and all I did was say good morning. Or when, you know, even at events where people snob you out and they say, you know, I'm, I'm not interested. But I, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I repeated this story to someone, and when I was done the story, he told me that he heard it from the person that happened to itself, and I repeated it correctly. And I love the story, and I, and I use it all the time. Um, like I said, I have ten. I have ten fundraisers working for me, and I share this story with them a, a lot of times. Because, and I, I, with each one, I've probably said it more than once. To mechazek them when they're in a in a, you know, come out of such a story. Um, there was a someone who who Panovich sent to America to fundraise for for the yeshiva, and there was a donor who gave him an amount of money that he felt was very embarrassing. It was humiliating from him, for him to take that small of a donation. So he went to Reb Shach. And when he got back, and he said, I'd like to rip up the check. Can I? So Reb Shach said, who paid for your trip to America? I said, Panovich. And the food, Panovich. You're fine. And who pays for your family's you know, mortgage? Panovich. Tuition, Panovich, Panovich. He says, the same Akhrai as Panovich has to pay for all those things Panovich has to make sure that you feel like a mensch. If you don't feel like a mensch from that check, go rip it up. Really? Wow. Just a quick break for a quick word from our sponsors. Sensible Marketing. If you are an operator, administrator, marketer, owner of any healthcare facility and you're looking to fill your beds, then give Sensible a call. They know how to do it. They've been doing it for many years. They know what needs to be done. So give them a call and you'll be in good hands. Back to the episode. And obviously, uh, if a fundraiser applies this rule too often, that's bad news. But what I say is, if somebody's nasty to you and somebody just makes you feel little and they're really giving you the runaround, they don't talk to you nicely. They make you feel clean. They make you feel like a schnur when you're not a schnur and you're a professional. The mensch is nisht zoicha. He's not zoicha. 
There are the fish in the sea. You move on. You have no responsibility to your, to your moisid to go after somebody that's embarrassing you and making you feel bad about yourself. And I believe that very strongly. If someone you know, wants to act like that and be not nice to a fundraiser, then... I, I hope it's not too often. Not you said like it's a place of giving. No, so, absolutely yeah. not too often. I say if a fundraiser yeah. applies, it's too often. It's bad yeah, news, bad right? News. But you know, you, you ask me for incidents. Those yeah. are the, the you know Hebrew. They say the fashla, the the you know the disasters. The disasters, right. Baruch Hashem, are far, far and few between. Yeah. But when it does happen, you have to know that this person is just not zayicha, and you move on to the next people because, again, people are so giving. People ask me a lot of times. I get this question. They say. How do you deal with all the bad news? You're dealing with patients, you're hearing horrible stories, people in terrible matzah. I was wondering that, but also, yeah, are you involved in the actual... Yeah, so I, I deal with... A, a lot of the cases will come through me because people know me. So I'll, I, could, I could be on initial calls or in, in the beginning of the process and then sometimes stay in touch with them more on a private basis because my medical team and, and uh, my financial team are, are directly working with the patient, but a lot of times I'll stay in touch with the patient myself. Um... So how do you, but also, you know, all the, all the stories I'm constantly hearing and everything. How do you deal with that, right? People ask that all the time. It's so painful, right? Yeah. And I see, you know, why do, why do I have to focus on that? Think about how many thousands, tens of thousands of people donate to the organization, people who take from their own money and give. How many hundreds of volunteers are supporting the fundraising efforts across Klai Israel? Think about how many times you shared a story with somebody and watched that person cry or tear up because of their because of their hearts and how much they appreciate the organization, right? I, I, I choose to focus on that. I choose to focus on the Klyasol's incredible, incredible, incredible goodness. Think again, focus on that guy who gave his Karen of an check. And that's what that, that that's gonna inspire you. There's no reason to get down when you hear what's happening. There's no reason to 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 you know get yourself all, all bent out of shape. This, it, it doesn't help you anything, right? You, it, when it comes to a patient, it's action based. You got to help them. You got to do what's needed. Kuach nefesh, it's atzala, right? You you run and you take care of this story. Of course, if you sit and you dwell on it, it it'll hurt you. It makes you feel bad. And of course, Hashem, not to say that I don't have a heart and I don't cry when I hear a story. But how does it not get me down? It doesn't get me down because of what everybody in Klai is doing, because of the event that you and Mayor are involved with oh. on the committee of, and, and how you put effort in. You've done video promotions to invite people to come in the neighborhood. I tell people... Why do the... you do that for? Why do you do it for, right? What's it that you, Baruch Hashem, are not a recipient of the organization, so why are you doing it for? It, it touches my heart when you do that. Right? Why are you putting yourself out there on a video and, and, and you know making it humorous and putting yourself out there on behalf of the organization? That's what I focus on, and that inspires me. It inspires me deeply. Beautiful. Yeah, I, tell, I don't know if this is correct. I said the CC, and RCCS stands for credit card. But the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, what shifted when like, Raise It and, and uh, these online platforms came about? So we, in, in, in terms of Lakewood specifically, we never really ran a big online campaign, right? We did now um, the Lakewood campaign, which so far we had over 30 parlor meetings. Beautiful, unbelievable, just to see how people are giving. Um, and we culminated it with a little on, with the online campaign with some razors, and we did very nicely, but it wasn't, you know, all out online campaign. Um, and, and the reason we didn't switch over is because, it, you know, that, that the, an online campaign really takes away the Kesher between the organization and the donor. It's becomes all about the organization and the raiser. And the, the donations, the donors can come and go. It depends if the raiser still has a relationship, got the guy or didn't get the guy. If the raiser came back, didn't come back. And you have no cash with the, with the donor. There's obviously a tremendous amount of value because these campaigns are making a tremendous amount of money. But there's a, the, the factor of, okay, I'm completely losing the cash with my donors. Nobody knows who we are. They don't get to hear what we do. Most most of the reason they're giving is they're giving because of their friend, and they could probably give it for save the whales also, right? right. You lose that whole kasha with the donor. So in Lakewood, where we have a Baruch Hashem, a fantastic ground game. My my colleague Rebcheski Gershbaum, who runs the Lakewood division, right, is a fantastic ground game to get out and meet people and talk to people and telemarketing speaks to thousands of people and there's thousands of people attending events. Do we have that kasha with people? And I don't think that there's. Uh, it's always a. Uh, you know, in the back of your mind, bugging, maybe we should switch to online, right? But the value of that Kesher that we have with people, the fact that when I go out to events, I I know, you know, I either know or, or recognize probably 50% of the people that come in there, and it's, th wow. and it's thousands of people, and and more of them than I recognize, recognize me and, and come over to say hello. 
right? That Kesher that you build with people is very, very, very important, very, very valuable, and it's what we bank on to, to fundraise for. So to give that up to switch to online would be very difficult. But on the flip side, in all our programming in, in New York, in Brooklyn, Flatbush, Muncie, Five Towns, um, you know, say at Queens, we were doing events in all these places, and then, you know, uh, the, great, the great COVID storm came and shut it all down. Um, Lakewood was not shut down as long, and we were able to get back into events over there. We couldn't, so we were forced to go online. And when we went online, we started making a lot more money. More than parliament meetings. Yeah, but we, we, you know, it's not as easy in other communities to do these little parliament meeting events because Lakewood has a lot of unity around schools or around developments and around neighborhoods that you you sort of cash in on, and it's not the same in in every community. Some of these places have huge schools. Of a thousand people, some of them have shuls of fifty people. They're not developments. They're not neighborhoods. They're blocks. They're streets, and it's very hard to find that. I, you always want to find a, a united group and rally within it. It's much harder to do that in other areas. Um, there's also different cultures in different communities about what type of events and what the standards are, and you can't do the same project in every place. And we were doing much more high-end events and. Events that raise much more money, but at the end of the day, when we switched to online, and all of a sudden, we were able to get a lot more people involved, and you know they go ballistic and send the messages literally, literally everywhere, right? And, you know, sending it to their friend in Timbuktu also, and it just made a lot more money. So it was uh, probably easier than also that. running events. So what, what's happening now though is that a lot of the guys want to shift back to events. Oh really? Yeah. And what we're finding is that the best thing is the hybrid between the event and the website are the strongest thing because if the people are energized by the event that they're going to be making, then they're much, much happier sending out the link. They don't feel like they're a razor and they're schnurring. I'm doing an event. Come to my event. Give. And they, they do the same thing. They'll go ballistic with their links, shooting it all over the place together with the flyer of the ad. And what ends up happening is they could raise a ton of money before you even come into the event. Right. And then it really made a huge difference. Like events that we had that did like, there's one specific event we did that uh, was doing like $40,000 when it was an event. And then when it went online, it also did like $40,000. And the next year, when we did the online with the event together, it went to 90. Oh, wow. So the two together are very, very, very powerful. Is there a standard amount for a typical parlor meeting in Lakewood, or it's like uh, every place is different? It's, it's all over yeah, the place. Yeah. It's all over the place. I'm saying. Yeah. You know, we have like our lower ones and our our smaller ones and our bigger ones. A lot of the smaller ones are, we've been doing for a very long time and they're already making a lot of money by now. People come every year, they give their annual donation, they try so to grows, step it up and it just I keeps guess. growing and growing and growing. Like the checks are getting bigger or it's more people? The the people continue. People it, tend to give more it's money. It's not really that, that there's more people. I think it's people try to go up. That's just a general rule, right? Yeah. People you know like to see what they gave last year and then they try to give a little bit more. Um, also, you know, if 20% of the people who came last year didn't come, but, you know, a new 20% came, so, you, and then you call the old guys and you get that also, and then, so every year it's, you know, some guy came, some guy didn't come, but you run each one like it's a little, um, a little, a little campaign on its own, and you build up till, you know, most of the development, most of the neighborhood gives every year, and if they don't come to the event, then you call them, if they do come, you know, that that's how it works, um. Some of the newer neighborhoods, the ones that, you know, where we, let's say, do a little bit nicer events, a lot of them are not, we're not doing for nearly as long. They're newer areas, newer neighborhoods, and it takes time more to, time to yeah. build it up. When you also do this kind of hit and run process, you don't get to do the same prep work before and the same follow up afterwards because tomorrow's another one and the next day's another one. So every night you're. you're I, I haven't night. been home. Um, I haven't been home since we started events a week after Pesach. I think I was home for supper once. Wow. And the food at the parlor meetings to me is the most nauseating thing in the whole world. Uh, I, I can't even, I can't even look at it. It's the same thing every night. I can't, <laughs> I can't touch it. Like I go crazy. I want. Can we discuss the your hockey? Uh, yeah, hockey yeah, sure. Let's jump right in. So at some point, I guess you saw the need, or or I don't know the need. You saw you had an idea of running a hockey campaign. How did that come to be? So the the hockey tournament is really uh, my my colleague is from Merkin, lives here in Lakewood, and uh, another colleague um, Suki Silver who joined us a little bit later, 
Um, so Mayer was working in uh, at a different organization, and he did a basketball tournament. And he had a friend, uh, Gabriel Jacobson, who told him that, why don't we do a ice hockey tournament? I'm like, ice hockey? Oh, yeah. I think that's I Toronto only, it. yeah. Who plays ice hockey? I didn't even know that they play ice hockey in Toronto. Right yeah. now, I should name on nobody. You know, I don't know a thing about hockey, and I still don't. <laughs> um, but it was like, who, who, who plays hockey? I mean, and he said, no, you'd be very surprised. There's a lot of from guys that play, and they're very passionate about it, and I think you do well. So he left that organization. He ended up coming to work by us, and he brought the idea with him. In the beginning, everyone was pretty skeptical. I've been made many times that I, I voted against it. Uh, bad idea. So if I said things here that people think are good ideas, they should know that I'm not always right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I voted against it. I thought it was, I, I had a different issue with it because we, we work very well with territories and all the different fundraisers have their own areas and it allows us to work tremendously with Shalom and all the fundraisers just want to help each other. And this would be like an event that's going to start crossing place into in different neighborhoods. Territories, and yeah. So I, that was the main reason I, I was worried about it. But um, even then, I think the idea was like we were going to have 10 teams and they would each raise $12,000. It would be $120,000. And, you know, the teams were there. People were excited. And so our board said, you know, go for it. And I remember sitting um, at one of the early meetings. The board's a Hasidish board, I'm assuming. Yeah, Hasidish guys. So what do they think about hockey? It's great, yeah. <laughs> to them, it's all fundraising. They don't, yeah. they don't care for this. Uh, um, so we were sitting at a meeting with uh, Investors Bank. And the... Uh, they asked, uh, one of the guys sitting with us told the bank that we're looking to raise a half a million dollars. I almost like fell off my chair. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It was like, what you, what you just like, why'd you tell the guy you're out of your mind? <laughs> why'd you say such a number? And we ended up raising $700,000 and it's amazing, but there's, there are, wow. there are three teams from Lakewood and a lot more guys that want to come, but there isn't room. Really? And there's four teams from North Jersey and three teams from Brooklyn, one team from Crown Heights, and four from Muncie, and a, guy, a team from Philly, guys from Baltimore, guys from guys coming from Chicago, Florida, from everywhere they fly, and even from Israel to play. And a hockey player is a lot more passionate than a basketball player because it's not about putting on a pair of shorts or old gotchkas to go out to the park and shoot some hoops that you need about six minutes to decide if you want to do it, and there's basketball courts on every other street. You See, have to book when you go, you go. You have to book yeah. ice time in well in advance. You have to book it if you want to make sure that, that you have ice time. It's called right uh, the hour, hour and a half of ice. You have to book it well in advance. So what happens is in a lot of communities, there's like one guy who's uh, you know takes care of hockey and he'll go and he'll book ice time for the year, like every Wednesday or every Tuesday and every Thursday. I got he has an hour and a half, and he gets and then he has to make sure that it gets filled up. And then so every guy that plays has to pay. So you have to be like on the end to get into the games, right? And it's all pre-scheduled. So you know which nights you go. And they need you for the team. You can't not show up, right? And you have to drive a half an hour. And you have to put on uh, a whole you know, suit of armor that can yeah. take 20 minutes to put on, a half an hour to put on. And then you get on and you're flying 20 miles an hour. And adrenaline is pumping. And it just and they took a half an hour to get out and take a shower and go home and then drive home. It could be a three hour thing to just go play a game of hockey. Right. Obviously it depends where people live. And I was did a little investigation of what's going on in hockey here in Israel and I heard that it, um there's an uh facility in Netanya and people are driving two hours on Matashavas to Netanya to play. Well wow. how many hours <laughs> is that taking them? Wow. And so the people are very passionate. So it's about not it. just Canadians playing in, in the a lot room? of the guys are Canadians who moved here. A lot right. of them, but a lot of guys grew up here also in North Jersey. They and, picked and up somehow ice hockey. So in North Jersey, Paramus, Teaneck, and even the five towns, the a lot of the high schools are playing ice hockey. There's a lot of the, the yeshiva leagues, a lot of hockey going on. But it's that passion that these guys have that they're channeling into the tzedakah. The love for hockey, the enjoyment, the passion that they have is being channeled into raising money for cancer patients. And that's why... It, the the response was it was way more than we ever thought and it continues to be that way. Where people What's just, the side behind it that people are able to get to make it cool and people to come out and do I and, and yeah. we are, we are the I don't know if you have like uh, full, full gear full, and all that full, stuff full, yeah. full uniforms full gear full jerseys. So how do you, it's how does a that very work? complex program with of all incentives and challenges and and um, and again Sumaya Merkin does a phenomenal job 
working with the individual players to develop a relationship and encourage them to raise, explain them the importance of the organization and, and get them charged up to work hard. And obviously, you're talking about, again, wonderful players, wonderful people of Klai Yisrael who, when they get a feel for something, so they come in for the cheshek for hockey, but they're now they have a slahavas and... I think get, that they have they a thing for co- competition in the sport, and they make it that you know, competition with the fundraising. Maybe you yeah, think no, also, it, you know, it, it, when there's a slahavas for something, yeah. right? So you, you can, you can, it, it could catch the fire can get bigger, right? So the guy's excited about the event, and it's an epic, you know, uh, thing, and and you put it, put the stucker into it, and they, it just makes them feel so much better about doing it, and. And it makes them feel so much better when it's done. They just feel like I had the greatest time. I helped sick people. So, but it, it's that it's that fire and that passion that that's gunning the you know the fundraising and 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 of course tzaddikim tzaddikim. I guess from that angle, you get people also to reach out to their friends and push their friends. You you do have the online raise it. Yeah, idea. no, for yeah, sure, for sure, that. it's that. But I I so saw you have another game in, in Cleveland area, right? Somewhere in the we, have, we have one in Chicago, one in Florida. We have two other tournaments that are a little bit smaller, one-day events, but they also do phenomenally well. I think um, my my at least my understanding in in uh, online fun, in online campaigns is that nobody should take me wrong about this because this is I, I spent I think enough time here talking about how special Claudius well is. Okay? But when you're asking somebody to do something as a mitzvah, right? So a mitzvah, my family comes first, my yeshiva comes first, my life comes first. I gotta take a break. I can't be busy with that now, right? And so a mitzvah, a person will push themselves hard. They'll try to do their best, but we do a lot of mitzvahs in our life, and we do. We're involved in multiple different chasadim, and we prioritize what comes first and what comes second. So, I, a mitzvah goes as a vait. Now, obviously, there are people who's it goes weiter, and there are people who invest more, and there are people who don't need any, uh, you know, presents, gifts, or anything, right? Yeah. But shaloy uh, lishma goes further than anything else. If you can start it off with a shaloy lishma thing, right? You can create something that's going to make a person enjoy it in an agashmiistic level. Then it goes way further for Tzedakah. And a lot of the organizations today are, are learning this about the online campaigns, especially now that there are so many. And most people have, like, I think have learned to not get psyched by, there's a matcher, or I have to give my friend a million dollars. People start saying, okay, you know, every guy who reaches out to me, I'll give him 50 bucks, right? Right. And so the, the, the Razor, when he gets into it and, and, and he gets excited... And then he can like this. I think the organizations are all realizing this. Then he'll that's push harder. the engine that, that that keeps it going, right. and that's why most organizations today are not wasting money. It's brilliant. They're investing in giving the raisers a good time, making a, a launch event, making a fine, uh, you know, a huge finale event, giving beautiful gifts, and some organizations are even taking the guys on huge trips now. Right? There's an organization that took people. To Europe, there's organization of people to Niagara Falls, and these things are all brilliant, and they're not wrong, and they're not wasting money. They're very, very smart, and it's not because people are dumb or stupid or not balichesed, but if you couldn't build up that shalayl uh, uh, component, that people are going to do it because they really enjoy it and it's a good time and all that, then it'll just go much, much, much further. Because the razor will push his friends to give more money. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's the same thing I was saying before. Once there's passion, people yeah. are excited about something. It's so much easier for them to then hitch it. To, it's so much easier to hitch tzedakah to it, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Gotta, one more, let's wind down. One more question, then I'll jump into our closing questions. I'm curious about the Hasidic community here. Do are they familiar with like? I mean, I don't, they don't do hockey, but the, what does fundraising look like there? The parlor meetings, like what goes on? No, we there? haven't really. We don't really talk about hockey much. I don't. I don't, yeah. I don't advertise hockey really at all. You know the the organization we're we're sensitive to the sensitivities right. of all the different communities, and it doesn't need advertising. It, you know, people who enjoy it get to, to partake, and we you know. So I guess I know about it from the statuses of my friends who are part yeah, of the tournament. Like, well, so, people yeah. know, know, people don't know, don't know. It doesn't really make right. a difference. It's we still have plenty more money to raise after it, and then. Uh, um, uh, you asked me if the Chesidic community, they, if we're fundraising in the Chesidic uh, neighborhoods. Uh, is, it, is it the same? I'm assuming you are. I'm assuming if it's the same. Is it also the regular parliament meetings that the Litvish Island appreciates or yes. something? Yes, yeah, so I'll, t- so I'll tell you this. I mean, 
RCCS at the core is a Hasidic organization. It's right. a Satmar organization. The Hasidic community knew about RCCS long before the Litvish community knew about RCCS. So most of the Hasidic Eden that live here in Lakewood grew up in Williamsburg, Borough Park, Muncie, Monroe, and they, they've been hearing about RCCS since they're a little kid, and they have a deep appreciation for it. And the Hasidic Kehla, like the Lakewood Kehla, is, is tremendously, tremendously giving. Everybody's giving all the time and, and, and giving beautiful amounts. So it's not it, there's no difference in terms of the Nadiva Salev and how they give. and uh, But every community has their own flavor. Just like I said in Lakewood, there are neighborhoods where we have smaller events, neighborhoods where we have nicer events, because you want to talk to the culture. And, and, and uh, you know, it's not just the culture. It's how harassed they are, how many events they have. Right? You, have to, you have to work with everything. You have to work with that, with that also. You have to... So the menu is different. The menu is different. You got to talk Yiddish. You know, you got to have your ads have to be in Yiddish. They have to have a Yiddish feel, Yiddish spin, Yiddish marketing twist. And you got to have Hasidish representatives there. So right How's now... How's Yiddish? So, my Yiddish is good. But oh, right yeah. now, the, 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 our Hasidish fundraising team in New York is the ones uh, who are mainly the lead on working in the, in the Hasidish neighborhood south of Lakewood. And they work together with us on it. So uh, we wouldn't claim to be able to... Be, do it the way uh, Hasidish uh, fundraiser right. would know how it's, but and the, it comes down to all the same thing in every neighborhood every kihili you go to but uh, so all these um, uh, uh, bikeathons and walkathons and, and things that, that, that didn't hit the Hasidish community is there any kind of uh, I think a lot of Hasidish go of, to the A time um, Shasathon uh, Shasathon okay. um, and I mentioned before um, a, a, an organization that does huge trips so that also so that's right. uh, that's a big Hasidish, uh, that has a very strong Hasidish component to that to that fundraising right. campaign. So I think every it, it's it's all the same. Everyone's the same. You know, I have a rule in the office that many of the fundraisers tell me that when they were meeting in a new community and the community started telling them, the people were telling them, "Oh, you know, our community is different. We get her." I say, just do me a favor, just use the word "blip" and I'll know what you meant. I don't, you don't even have to bother telling me, me the whole spiel because every neighborhood we go to, every single neighborhood. Every community across Klai Yisrael, you get this. The first thing is, you got to understand, we're different. By us, there's this. And by us, there's that. And at the end of the day, we're so much. This is in general. Klai yeah. is very different, right? But we're so, we forget that we're so much more similar than, than we're different. Exactly. Right? We're 99.9999% yeah, the it's same. It's a small nuance. I open might be bottle different. caps and Shabbos and you don't, right? right. We, we're both at the Shabbos table eating get filled the fish and chalent, right? It's not the, yeah. we're way more the same. And that's the same with fundraising. We're way more the same than we're different. It's just how you wrap it. Beautiful. Okay, closing questions. Is there any myth or misunderstanding about the work you do that you'd like to debunk or explain? I would say two parts. I'd say as far as the organization, um, one of the main things that we've been doing with our campaign that we just ran, and we're still in the middle of running parliament meetings in town, but is the, is the, we've been doing this raise the bar concept that we've been doing that to not, I guess not to correct something, but to expand on what people know about us. Because in fundraising, the easiest thing to do is to tell people we need your money, so we give it to somebody else. People appreciate that well, and they have an easier time giving towards that. But RCCS... Our main objective today is the medical part. We have 22 people divided into 12 teams, each focusing on another of the major cancer categories. They each know every doctor and the nurse and the secretary and the cell phone numbers of every nurse and doctor and et cetera. They have deep relationships. They know the latest trials, treatments, medications, and they're an unparalleled team who can provide a really, really unparalleled level of, of guidance, service, case management, referral to any cancer patient. And we want to make sure that people know that that exists because so much of our marketing has always been pay insurance premiums, pay insurance premiums, because that's the easiest thing for fundraising. But so we make a duggish on pointing that out this year that there's, and, and, and most of the patients in Lakewood that, that do turn to us are taking full advantage of the medical uh, part of it. And But if there's people out there who, let's say, think, I don't need money, so I need to go to RCCS, we want to make sure that they know that that's there also. Another thing I debunk is just the same point I was saying before, and it's not about me or our organization at all. It's a fundraiser is the same professional as everybody else, probably more professional. What a fundraiser has to do in terms of marketing, coordination, event planning, um, networking, donors, convincing, 
all that that ridiculous amount of skill that goes into fundraising, if it was applied to the working world, the guy would be a rich man. And you see this all the time with fundraising, all the time, Rosh Hashem, because Klai still needs the fundraisers, but you see where fundraisers move into the business world, and they're very, very, very successful people. It takes it, you got to use all five of your chushim when you fundraise. You have to be firing on all cylinders, ready at all times of the day. You can run out night, day, morning, Sundays, Matzah Shabbos. And it takes a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous wow. amount of skill. And some people might look at it and say, oh, he was a schnarrer. Just the schnarrer guy shouldn't be in fundraising. The guy who knows how to do it is the one who, who should do it and the one who's successful. And those guys, if they had your job, might do better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to see how much bracha has to be on board. So yeah, no, no uh, yeah, it's not even a doubt. I once asked my kids what RCCS does. They said it was a toy store, because I always bring home the yeah. stuff for them. But they, 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 know, my my kids know that why I'm not home a lot and why I'm not around at nights and what we're doing. And they love the organization to death. And they, you know, constantly selling kugel on the street for RCCS. So can you walk me through the process? This is not a closing question, but a curiosity question. If someone, let's say, I would assume is diagnosed with cancer and they make their first call to RCCS, what does that look like? So a lot of people who call into RCCS are people who sometimes just are at, at the suspicion level, but the doctor told them there might be something, and Baruch right. Hashem, they know our number and they know what we provide, and they'll call us right away. When a person gets the diagnosis of cancer, and you, it's self-understood, they think... They think their life's over. Right? That, that word is synonymous with death to most people. If you say the and, machla, many people don't yeah, even say the word. And, yeah. it, and, and, and people just clamp up. They just, you know, they're in, it's a tremendous fear. And all of a sudden they're thrust into a world that's very, very complex. It's not as simple as go here, go there, and you'll be fine. Right? It's, it's not about a, a directory of where the best doctor is. It's... it's really takes a tremendous amount of people and guidance and thought and figuring out which is the best doctor and which team is the best team and to get other doctors involved from other hospitals and discussions about how to treat a patient. It's very, very complex. And there's so much of the, even the back office stuff, the scheduling, the appointments, the documentation, and then the insurance, if a person can't afford to pay for the insurance or they're on the wrong insurance. And all these issues are uh, when a person's just literally got the probably the worst news they've ever gotten in their whole life about them or worse someone that they love is it, it's it's a it's one of the worst situations a person could be in and then to find that okay and now not only am i am i you know scared to death and 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 desperately worried and you know heart no pun pounding. intended when you say scared to yeah. death yeah but my, you know my heart's pounding i also now have to stop figuring out the ridiculous amount of complex right. medical things and financial things that i have no idea how to possibly do the biggest mitzvah you could possibly do for somebody at that point is to say, you're going to be fine. There's so much that can be done to help you. We know what, what you're going through. We know where you need to go. We've dealt with a thousand cases of, uh, like, you, like yours. We have it. We got you covered. We're going to take care of every step for you. We'll tell you exactly where to go. Our financial people will call you in an hour. I'll make sure that everything's taken care of. You won't have to worry about the money. We'll tell you that exactly what doctor appointment. I had, uh, the best line, and I've heard this more than once, was I didn't have cancer, RCCS did. Wow. And one guy took it a step further and he said, I felt like I was working for RCCS. They tell me, could you do us a favor and show up in Sloan Kettering at 1 o'clock on Tuesday? And I say, sure. I got my... Do your favor. I'll do your favor, I'll go. <laughs> wow. I said, that's the... That's... It's such a Yeshua. It's such a... And, and so many times, it's so terribly complex. There are so many stories of, of people who are, you know, went to one hospital and the hospital gave up, told them, uh, you know, you have only a few years left to live. We'll give you light chemo to extend, extend life. And <clears throat> by knowing that there's a different hospital and a different team that had a different protocol and bringing the patient there. And then the, this just happened recently to a, a young girl. So, you know, I'm a little bit involved in the story and, we brought it to a different hospital, and they did a different protocol, a different type of testing, and a different mixture of ke of chemo, and she's 100% cancer-free. Wow. To know that, to know who, when, we are what, what's the person's other medical conditions, what's their age, what is it, what are the differences, what, you know, what difference will it make if they travel far away, right? Will that be harder on them? Will it be easier on them? Will they have their family around them? All these things, from the financial to the emotional to the medical, all have to be taken into consideration for every single patient and that's what our team does by being hyper focused each one on one specific cancer and knowing that one inside out backwards and forwards 
They can make sure that every single patient has is just perfectly taken care of. Does, does it ever happen that someone passes away due to lack of funds? I hope not. Not for us, uh, yes. Yeah. But I, I'd say that that's for sure, that for sure has to be true. For sure has to be true. The first patient who came to RCCS, who came to Rapasha Cohen and asked him for help, that was, this, that was the conversation. He said, I have, I forgot how many children it was, maybe it was, you know, 11, 12. <coughs> they said, my children are going to lose their father because I can't pay my insurance and I lapsed. And now I'm in just a community hospital being treated and there are doctors and hospitals that could save me and I can't go. Because I can't pay for it, so it's to- it's definitely totally possible, and I'm sure in communities outside of the Yiddish Kehila, where they don't have the same concept of trying to figure out hospitals or uh, or un- understanding the the healthcare system and the insurance system, right. to make sure that everybody gets the best, then they could end up in a place that can't take care of them. I, I think that's absolutely true. Wow. And also in that case, like then the family, the twelve kids are probably formed the community anyways. They don't just give money now instead of waiting for to sure. have to pay. For no, these. no doubt about it. It's it's. Um, but I said yeah. people don't realize it's it's their neighbor. There's not a a parlor meeting that I we go to or an, you know an event that we do that one two three people don't walk over and say I just want you to know my kid was sick and you guys were am- I had this last night my kid was sick and what you guys did was incredible and I asked him who <coughs> who from our office did you talk to he said you know what I can't remember it was such a blur and then another person came up to me at the same event and said my wife was sick and you guys just I was on the phone with you all day and all night right it's wow. it's um, it's real it's also the fascists it's it's dealing with the core the core of the issue right the core of the issue the medical part of it just right. the healing that's what RCCS focuses on is a wonderful organization is doing tremendously valuable work and the beauty is that everybody works together and complements each other and we don't really see a need to do things that Baruch Hashem are being done so beautifully, but to stay at the core and make sure that the person lives. That's right. what RCCS is focusing on. If you were able to, what advice would you give your younger self first starting at RCCS? How many years ago? I started, ten, I started a little over 10 years, ten years ago. ago. What advice would you give your younger oh, that's self? That's a tough question. You must have learned something Probably over the take years. things personally. Yeah. I think so. You know, you have to you have to, to get, get a little skin. bit of a, you yeah. know, a little armor and and not not care when someone someone brush you know so so maybe says something that might put you down or or even from the you know the chase you could feel down from the you know you feel bad about it right be a wonderful person or a wonderful person that you're chasing maybe for may, maybe it's for an event maybe it's for a meeting but and you start to feel like you know. You know, maybe it's me, and I don't know how to do it, and other people can do it better, or you know, maybe the guy doesn't like me, or right. and you know, it's again, you're dealing. Fundraising is very much psychology, and you're dealing. Yeah. with it's an emotional. There's an, a strong emotional piece, and you want an emotional fundraiser because you want him to be able to appreciate what he's doing, also to be able, to, and he should appreciate the person who's donating to him. Right, those two things is the, the, that connection is so valuable. Right and a, a person who has a heart and you know could feel bad and and could feel you know when they're turned down or when they get a no and but eventually you learn that it's just to some degree a numbers game. There's for every yes there's a no or for every two yes right. there's, for every two yet no's there's a yes and it's a matter of working your way through it. Nobody means it personally to you and and you just keep going. Interesting question. I don't know if you know the answer, but I have many people in my contacts who are muted on the WhatsApp because they go through there. Thank you, Uncle Maishi. Thank you, good neighbor David. It's so powerful. Do you think that it's helpful and powerful? It's so powerful. It's the funniest thing, but it's so powerful. Yeah. <laughs> it's so powerful. I you know certain people like I'm look I keep seeing their status and like I'm like, oh shoot, I gotta give them I, I, I you know I know they, they expect me to give a donation, right? I just push it past. I want, and then like you go, you go an hour later, and you see it again, and he's thinking Yankel, and he's thinking, oh, shoot, I still haven't given him yet. And then you come back an hour later, and he's thinking Pinchas, like oh man. So then you fuck it, I gotta do it, I gotta do it. And you click on the link, and you make the donation, and then you, you see your you definitely name. go back and check to yeah. see what he wrote about you. If you're the Isha Chesed at Sadik, who saved the whole world, and and it just it's it's all momentum, it's all energy. That's the whole psychology of the whole thing. And WhatsApp status. Big I'm not endorsing or not endorsing, but it's a tremendous brook at the fundraising. <laughs> Do you have any skills or hobbies that you could share with us? Do you like play drums or juggle? 
play the kazoo. Uh, I, I I say I, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. I could draw a little bit, but it's undeveloped. Um, yeah. I enjoy singing, but I'm not great at it. Um, all right. <laughs> I like graphic design. I like, uh, you know. Any mess? Last question. Any message for the Lakewood com- Greater Lakewood community? Stay loving, stay holy, keep giving, and that's what keeps Clydesdale going around. All right. Thank you so much. There you have it. Thank you for listening to another Our Town episode. Thank you, Aaron Steyer. Now it's time for you to take out your checkbook and make a donation for the wonderful organization and the wonderful work that RCCS does. For any guest suggestions, reach out to us, OurTown at LNNews.com. Sponsor our opportunities, OurTown at LNNews.com. We'll be back at you next week with some more great guests. But for now, continue being uniquely you. I can't wait to hear your story someday.